Hi everyone. This is Dark Matter Knits episode 8. It is April 26th, 2014 and I'm your host Elizabeth Green Musselman. Um, today our theme is called Bind Off Loosely and it kind of loosely ties together everything as per usual as you shall, as you shall see. I had a bit of an adventure today so I'm a little bit <laughs> Bedraggled, sorry for the wet hair, and a little dopey. Uh, I went for a run today, as I usually do on a Saturday, and uh, decided to go on a part of the Colorado River that I don't normally go on. I thought it was finished trail. It wasn't. So I normally run for about three and a quarter miles or so, and I ended up kind of running and walking for about seven. <laughs> so I'm ex egg exhausted. But uh, but it was good. So I'm here, and I've got... The reason my hair is wet is I've got just a short, scant amount of time to record before my son gets back from his uh, friend's birthday party. So um, I'm going to record now, wet hair and all. So the theme for today, bind off loosely. Uh, it kind of ties together a couple of things. One of them is... Um, at the end, I'll show you a technique video about Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, which is one of my favorite bind offs, but I've had a number of people tell me that they don't like it because it, um, although it is a very loose and stretchy bind off, which, you know, you're often called upon to do, as we'll talk about later, it, uh, a lot of people find that it's too loose, that it's actually really ruffly. So I'm going to show you not just how to do it, but also how to do it in such a way that it doesn't ruffle, or at least not nearly as much as uh, sometimes people find. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I'm also going to talk about a couple of other a couple of other things. Uh, one of them is that uh, the knitting that I was doing this week was total stress relief, and I just thought it would be interesting to talk about how and why knitting can act in that role. How it is that knitting can kind of calm you at those times when you're sort of freaking out, <laughs> which I was doing earlier this week. So talk about that more in a minute. In fact, I'll probably get to that first, just so you're not sitting there wondering, good God, woman, what is wrong? It's not that, it's not bad. Don't worry, I'm fine. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about is, uh, some of the foibles of my recent shawl design. I have a bunch of designs that have either just come out or are just about to come out. And uh, the process of designing the shawl was especially funny. And <laughs> I just thought it was a really good object lesson in learning how to have a sense of humor about to have, you know, kind of, which I suppose is where the bind off loosely comes in, to just kind of let go of some of my perfectionist tendencies. I tend to be really... I know I may come off as kind of uh, calm, <laughs> but I'm actually really... Uh, inside, I am an anxious person. I suppose that's the theme for this week, really. <laughs> but I can't just call it me and my anxiety, because really, who would watch that? And also, that has nothing to do with knitting. Although it does. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> so to start off with this week so this this thing that I'm wearing is something that I have cast on since the last time that I saw you which is a shawl called a little bit bohemian by I'm looking down at my notes Rebecca Rebecca Carmichael Stromgren and it's a, uh, a free pattern that you can access on Ravelry and uh, it's quite well written it's got uh, I have you know I had no problems with with the instructions no no errors, no lack of clarity. Uh, so basically, it is. I've made it much bigger than it is in the in the pattern, uh, but it's a very simple side to side shawl, kind of scarf like shawl, the shawlette style. As you can see, I still need to weave in the ends. I still need to block it too, um, which you can see because I haven't really, I haven't really blocked out the points yet. But it has these these cute little lace points that will look like little teeth coming off the bottom. So you basically just work it mostly in garter stitch with these little 
simple lace points coming off the bottom and uh, you increase one stitch at the end of some of the rows and then you get to the center and then of course you decrease as you go along. The reason why I knit this, a couple of reasons. One is that I've had this bamboo, um, oh gosh, I forgot to look up what it was called. It's a, uh, a bamboo cotton blend, I believe, that my sister-in-law gave me. She lives in Taos, New Mexico. And, um, and the yarn is, no, this is really totally going to bug me. Okay. It is called Strand, Strandivarius Organic Cotton Bamboo. And it is, uh, it's basically 50-50 cotton bamboo. And I believe it's locally dyed in New Mexico where she lives. It's really beautiful. She gave me two skeins of it, and they had very generous yardage. I think it's some, it's a DK weight, and it's something like 480 yards, so it's a massive amount of yardage. If I were a smaller person, I could make myself like a little tank top or something, but I am not a small person, so I made this shawl. And the reason uh, I picked it was because uh, bamboo is a really... Well, b both bamboo and cotton can be a little bit difficult to manage when you're accustomed to working with wool because they can really stretch out a lot. And uh, and the weight of them can kind of pull the garment out of shape even as you're wearing it. So I wanted to make something that um, was not knit from top to bottom and that wasn't really a garment per se, that was more of a shawl. And because it's a variegated yarn, because it's hand dyed, I wanted something that would pool as little as possible. I mean, there's really no way to avoid pooling, well, there are, but no simple way to, no unfussy way to avoid pooling. There are ways, I just didn't want to deal with them. So uh, garter stitch is a really great way to, uh, to split up pooling just because the pearl bumps you know, kind of give it a little extra texture that throw the color around. And um, and also the fact that the the length of the rows kept changing helped. So there are really just a few points, like this is really the main spot where things kind of clumped up a little bit. And there's another spot right there, but I kind of like it. Um, so, and I, I didn't even end up using the whole skein. I, I must, I think I added something like uh, 40 or 60 extra rows and I still didn't use it all. So, um, so yeah, I really like how this, this came out. Um, and I like, you know, wearing these scarf kerchief type shawls. Uh, the other reason I, I knit this this week, and this is what really kind of ties this in with the, the theme is that, <sighs> okay, so I'm in my forties, right? And that means it's mammogram time. And I'll tell you right now that if you don't like hearing stuff about bodies and medical care, if you're squeamish about that stuff, or if it's too much information, you're going to want to skip this part because I'm just going to talk about my mammogram. I'm not going to get into, I won't be gross, but I just think that, uh, I mean, everybody says you should get one, but it's, I think it's worth talking about some of the details of it and what it's actually like, because nobody ever really talks about that. So, or at least nobody ever did to me. Uh, so I've had mammograms before because I'm, I'm not just 40, I'm 43. So I've, I've had them every year for the last few years and they've always been fine. And this time I went and, you know, <laughs> this is how I always get my, my husband to, to squirm whenever I talk about mammograms. You know, they put you in the machine. It's an x-ray machine. And they, the, the technician like takes your boob and boom, like plops it onto this thing. And then they actually put a plate on it, depending on how large your breasts are. So, I always think that's so funny. You know, they kind of look at you and then they choose the plate depending on, you know, what, what you got. So yeah, they, so the way I, the thing that always just gets my husband is I, I tell him, you know, that then they take the machine and they, and they just crush it crush it. And actually the top to bottom one isn't so bad. It's that side to side one. Oh man. They crush it top to bottom and they're smooshing it out so they can see through as much of the tissue as possible. So they smoosh it this way and then they smoosh it that way. Ow. It just hurts. So, uh, yeah. So mine came back with an irregularity and that's all I heard, right? Was that 
there's an irregularity in your mammogram, you need to schedule a follow-up immediately. Okay, so I, I freaked out. <sighs> because I just, I haven't really talked to many people about, you know, the general, it's just not something you really talk about, you know? One of the reasons why I want to talk about it now. So I'm flipping out because of course I get the news that I've gotten this irregularity on my mammogram on my birthday when I'm not actually checking my messages. So all weekend, I'm freaking out about this. Freaking out inside, right? You know, I'm kind of all calm on the outside because I don't want my son to know about this. So, um, and then, you know, finally, this is actually one of those times where looking stuff up on the internet, medical stuff, is a good thing. Because I looked it up and it turns out that ir having an irregularity show up on your mammogram is actually fairly common. It's something like... Uh, I think something like 10 or 15% of mammograms come back with some kind of thing that needs to be followed up on. So that made me feel a lot better. So I go back. But in the meantime, right, I've got this whole weekend to try not to think about it. And this is where the knitting comes in. <laughs> That's when a lot of the knitting on this shawl happened. Because... Uh, it's, it was just one of those times, and maybe it's just because I haven't really had that many medical issues in my life, either in my own case or in people close to me, but it was, you know, it was one of those times where I really discovered what a boost knitting can be, or what a, what a solace, that's a better word, what a solace knitting can be when you're going through something like this. I mean, it, you know, that the whole thing that they talk about where knitting calms your lizard brain, where it just, like if you're sitting in a meeting and you just that the meeting is making you crazy and you just can't sit still a moment longer. The knitting helps. And, uh, and yeah, it was the same thing with this. I was just so fretty about it all weekend. And I couldn't really talk about it again because my son didn't really want to know about it. So I just had to internalize all of it. And so I just knitted and knitted and knitted and knitted and knitted and knitted, and knitted on the shawl. So I finally get in. So the follow-up, as it turns out, is that you get another mammogram and they look at that and they, you know, found the same thing, this little thing that they didn't know what it was. So then what they do is they take you in for an ultrasound, which having, having had a child, having an ultrasound on your boob is a really weird experience. You know, it's like, isn't that supposed to be a little lower, that thing you're moving around? Like, isn't there supposed to be something happy in there? I don't want you to find anything this time before I was hoping you would. But now, not so much. And uh, so they're just like, moving this thing around. It doesn't make that noise, but in my mind, it does. Moving it around, looking for something, looking, 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 looking. And even to top it all off, the, uh, the place where I had the ultrasound done was in the process of choosing a new ultrasound machine. So they had two different machines and they wanted to use them both on me. And then the sales reps for each of the different ultrasounds were in the room saying, and this is how you focus and this is how you up the gain and this is how you, you know, I'm just like, really? <laughs> I know somebody has to be the guinea pig, but it doesn't need to be her. Ah. Yeah, that was a little annoying. Uh, but, you know, two ultrasounds. You know, if they were going to find anything, they were going to find it with two, right? So, lots of scooping back and forth. They found nothing. But this means that, and here's step three in the process. Again, just so you know, in case this ever happens to you. Because they couldn't find anything, which in a sense is good, um... The problem is they've got this mammogram, two, two different mammograms that show something, and an ultrasound that shows two different ultrasounds, which shows nothing. So now they have a conflict and they don't just, you know, they're trying to be careful, which I appreciate. So they're, they don't want to just say, oh, well, let's just believe that it's the ultrasound. So now I have to go back for a biopsy. Needle biopsy. I need to start a new shawl. <laughs> what, what is a needle biopsy, you might ask? I'm sure you can imagine, for the most part, what that is. But 
basically it means that you lie down on a table. This is what they've told me. I haven't had it yet. With a hole cut in it that you, you know, lower your, your boob through. And, um, and then they, I don't know if they like raise you up like a car in an auto shop or what, but somehow they then take the biopsy out of your, out of you while you're lying there in this holy table. So that should be fun. So any recommendations for simple uh, de-stress knitting would be much, much appreciated. Um, and if you're the kind of person who worries, please don't, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not worried really about this. I mean, the radiologist was like, look, we're just trying to be careful here. I really don't think this is anything, but I just don't want to, I don't want to just let you go without double checking that this is okay. So, and she, and she had another radiologist confirm that, you know, they really don't think this is anything. So don't worry because I know you worry about me all the time. <laughs> Uh, so back to the knitting. So I'm sitting there, the, the ultrasound stuff took forever. I don't know what was going on in there that day, but I was in that office for like three hours and, uh, and, and they're great otherwise, but just, it was, I was just there a long time. And so, you know, I'm kind of, it's not really, it's one of those funny moments where people are kind of stressed, you know, because even if you don't think there's going to as I sort of got further along in the process, the women I was with were there because they had been called back, you know, so the kind of level of stress of the room kind of went up as I went along. And, uh, and you were all wearing these ridiculous capes, like, you know, that hospital gown material with the little flowers on it, the kind of thin material. So when you're getting a mammogram, they give you these, or at least in this office, they give you these little capelets made out of this stuff. It's so funny. I'm like, look, the cape looks back. And uh, and it just snaps in the front and you keep your, you know, pants or skirt on or whatever. So we just all look ridiculous sitting there in the waiting room with our little capelets on. And, um, and I'm just knitting away and it's like calming me enough that I've actually still sort of got a ludicrous sense of humor. So I turned to the woman next to me. There's three of us sitting in the room. It's a tiny little room. And I said, uh, I am so embarrassed that we all wore the same shirt here today because we're all wearing those capelets, right? And she just looks at me like, <laughs> they both did. Hmm. Too soon? So, uh, but yeah, I, I totally credit the knitting for keeping me, just keeping me at enough of a level of equilibrium that uh, I just don't think being on the phone or, you know, on my iPad would have been good at that moment. I just, I needed, I needed more of a physical distraction than that. I think, I think that's it is that it's not just a mental distraction. It's actually enough motion enough. It requires enough concentration and, uh, and coordination that, it really calmed me down. And I think that, that I think is really it is that it's physical and it's mental. It's not like it's exercise or anything really, but it's, it's enough movement. It's sort of like pacing really, I guess. And, uh, and yeah, it just really makes these kinds of situations bearable. I mean, you just, you figure, it's why these kind of simple projects are so brilliant at those kinds of times where you can just, you just think, I just need to do, I'm just going to do one more stitch and now one more and now one more. It's kind of like a day at a time sort of philosophy written, written down to a microcosmic level, you know, like just one stitch at a time. I'm going to be here a while. This is kind of freaking me out, but just knitting on my shawl until I have something better to do. Oh, thank goodness for knitting, huh? All right, enough about my breasts. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that just totally grosses you out. But like I say, the, these things, I mean, it's like colonoscopies, you know? Who knows what they're like until you, you actually know somebody who goes through it. And, and you, you want to know about these things. 
try. Don't worry, I'm at least seven years away from a colonoscopy, so you won't have to hear about it from me anytime soon. Okay, let's talk about something more fun, shall we? So I forgot to do some announcements at the beginning. Uh, one of them is that uh, I again have some people to thank for uh, leaving reviews on iTunes and uh, and for directing people toward my podcast. Really appreciate that, as always. Uh, on iTunes, Free Flower, who I know is Stacy Dawson from Mustache Podcast, another great one to watch. Um, she and 100 Projects and Anita G and Cappuccino 136 all left reviews in the last few weeks. And, um, and I really, really appreciate that. And I know some of you have also left, um, some ratings there as well. And, and, um, yeah, very kind of you to take the time to do that. And, uh, and the host of the In a Snit podcast also mentioned me in their, in their recent episode and as one of the podcasts that they enjoy watching. So again, thank you very much. Um, and I found out that I had actually... <laughs> I've been watching In a Snit for a while and thinking, I said this on their forum, I've been thinking, wow, that woman Christy looks so familiar. And it just, maybe I thought maybe she just looks like, because I always get this, people will tell me, you look so much like someone I used to know, or you look like my friend from high school, or I just have one of those faces, I guess, that people, that's sort of generic, I don't know. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe I just think Christy looks like somebody I know. No, I actually know her. <laughs> She mentioned it on the podcast. She's like, yeah, Elizabeth and I met each other in Austin. I'm like, oh my gosh, of course we did. She's a history professor. That's what I used to do. We met each other. She was in Texas. <laughs> Having a child turns your brain into Swiss cheese. Are you with me, people? The people who have children? I swear, it is like... I used to have a brain, and now somebody just took a hole puncher and went through it and wreaked havoc in there. All right. So, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is in addition to just what I'm, what I'm working on is that I've got a bunch of designs that are, that are coming out. And, um, and one of them is out already. It was a nice surprise because I, I finished making the sample and writing up the pattern, uh, Oh, back in September of last year, and these things just sort of take a while. This was a uh, a pattern that I was commissioned to do by Spud and Chloe. Squee! You know, it's my like my first big uh, yarn company commission, and um, well, not my first one, but it's the first big one. So the pattern is uh, I do a lot of men's patterns, as I've probably mentioned before, and. Uh, and so this one is a, a men's sweater. They found that they didn't really have enough men's garments in their collection. So uh, they asked me to do a men's sweater, and this is what I came up with. I even came up with him. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Everybody's like, ooh, who's the guy? I have no idea. I did not take this photograph. But it's a beautiful photograph. He's a beautiful guy in my sweater. He's holding snowshoes in the snow. We don't get snow here. So um, it, it is a, it's called the Colonel Henley. And it is a, I'm really proud of this sweater, actually. It's a top down, I would show you it, but they, they now have it. Um, like the actual sweater. So it's a top down saddle shoulder. So you actually start, uh, the collar is put on later, but you start up here at the top. Uh, you make sort of the neck and the saddles, and then you build out the yoke from there and start working the the body and the sleeves down. And then once you split off, once you get down to the armholes, you split off the sleeves and they're worked separately. So it's, uh, it's a really fun, and then you come back and, and put the collar on later. It's a really fun knit. Um, I even enjoyed knitting it as I was designing it, which isn't always the case. You know, I sometimes have to rip it back. And blah, blah, blah. But, uh, and I'm also really proud of how many sizes there are in this pattern. I did, uh, what is it? Extra large, extra large, small, medium, large, uh, extra large, 
2x and 3x. So I did eight sizes. That should fit anyone from a teenager to um, you know someone who's who's fairly large, and uh, and it's very adjustable. The length is, as you can probably tell from the fact that it's you know stocking it with just a little bit of shaping. Men look men's sweaters tend to look better when there's a little when the the um, you taper it down from the armholes down to the hips. So I did a little bit of that, just enough to kind of make it look a little more fitted, and. Uh, yeah, it's made in their sweater, which is a really nice cotton wool blend that is extremely comfortable. And for men whose temperatures tend to run a little bit higher, that cotton mixed in is a nice, uh, kind of lightens it up a little bit. So I'm really proud of that one. It's, uh, it's, I'm not selling it myself. It's, as I said, Spud and Chloe commissioned it, which means that they, um, they just sort of paid me outright for the design, I knit it up, wrote up the pattern, and then handed it over to them. They tech edited it, tech edited it, uh, photographed the sample, um, and then you know they just they have all the rights to it from now on, so it's it's theirs. But uh, you can find it at, at spudandchloe.com, and I, th I think it would really it would work well in a wool as well. It's a a worsted weight sweater. So that was exciting. And then um, I've shown you this already, but I'm about to release it. And I wanted to, to give you a heads up that it's about to come out. This is my Summer in Angers shawl. And um, and my it's also knit side to side in stockinette. And my favorite part are the little pendant beads at the bottom. I think that's kind of a fun feature. And, you know, it's another one of these that you can wear either this way around the neck or it's deep enough that you can actually wear it as a, you know, more as a traditional shawl. So that's about to come out. It's um, Summer in Angers, which, and Angers is spelled like Angers. <laughs> summer in Angers. Angers is a town in France, and uh, it's where we're going to be going this summer. I'll tell you about that another time. Uh, but I, I'm going to give you a heads up that for the first month, no, the first two weeks that this pattern is available, it's going to be a um, dollar off. So it's going to be $6 normally. And for the first two weeks that I put it up on Ravelry, which is starting Monday, uh, it will be $5. So I hope, uh, I hope some of you get it. It's my first pattern, one of my first pattern releases in a long time. I haven't really been doing a lot of pattern designing and it's as you can tell by my goofball faces I'm pretty happy about getting back into it and uh, the last thing I've got coming out I know it's like designorama today um, so some of these have been kind of in, in the works for a while but this one is a more recent one this is have I shown you this already I don't know I can't even remember if I have uh, this is a hat that I designed it's um, Primarily designed with men and teenage boys in mind, uh, but really, you know, it could be worked by anyone. And this is, I think I have shown this to you, this is the Jacob Marisbeth hat. And um, and this is also going to be coming out next week. And the, the hat is based on a young adult series of novels, a trilogy of novels, that uh, a historian of medicine in Cleveland is publishing through Cooperative Press, my publisher. And I just thought, even though the books have nothing to do with knitting, I thought it would be fun to have a hat uh, or a pattern because our press publishes so many knitting books. I thought it'd be fun to have a pattern to go along with the books. And um, and I took pictures this, uh, this past weekend or past week of my friend's 15 year old son wearing the hat. <laughs> so cute in it oh my gosh and he was so funny I mean everybody's awkward having their picture taken but really could there be anything more awkward than a 15 year old boy having to model something I mean, he was so sweet he's like what should I do with my hands <laughs> so I, I had to find him some props you know just so he wouldn't like start gnawing his fingernails off uh, so that's called the Jacob Jacob Marisbeth hat and I'll be releasing that next week as well. Um, so that's what I've been knitting on. The other thing, I guess that's 
I've been focusing a lot, as I say, on, on design work. Um, but I also have continued knitting further on my over the moon socks and they look ridiculous when they're not on my feet. <laughs> really? Does it look like my feet could be possibly be that long? But when you, when you stretch them out, they really like, they actually do fit my feet perfectly. And I love this cable. It is the coolest. It really doesn't show up well on my camera, but it does this cool thing where the cable is very small and then it kind of opens out into a broader cable and then back in again and then out again. And as it does that, the little opening out part kind of travels diagonally up the sock and it makes this cool little line that goes up. And I did, um, I did the heel as well, called the OMG heel, and I believe that is uh, the designer Megan Williams' own invention. It's really clever. It's uh, it's basically a way of doing a gusseted heel, but in reverse, since these are toe up. Uh, most people think of gussets, or you know, the kind of heel flap construction, as something that you do only on um, on top down socks. But there are various ways of doing it on a toe-up sock, and uh, and she has come up with this really ingenious way of um, of doing them, and it makes a pretty deep. I mean, even if you've got fairly high arches, I think you would be happy with this heel. I think the one thing I would say is that I wish I had started the heel a little bit earlier. Um, I think it's it's so hard to measure exactly where you're supposed to start a heel. And she does give you a recommendation about where to do it. And I think I wasn't quite stretching out the sock enough or something when I was measuring. So I don't think her measurements are off. I think I just didn't measure properly. So coming along, I mean, it's slow because I'm doing it on size zeros and... Um, you know, I have to concentrate on it when I do it. So it'll take me a little while. This is still the first sock, but I'm really enjoying these and I think they'll be gorgeous when I, when I finish them. And that's the, uh, the over the moon sock kit from Little Skein and the Big Wool. It's, it all comes together, not the needles, but the pattern and the, the yarn and this cute little, cute little project bag. So, that's what I've been up to this week. Well, so many, a couple of weeks. There's so many other things too, but there's only so much that you can listen to in one episode, aren't there? I think you've had just about enough of me and my body parts. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just checking to see if there's anything else I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, I never talked about, well, I'll just say a little bit about this, the, this shawl. I, I was going to, the whole issue of, um, the whole bind off loosely thing. This shawl was just such a, um, it was such an exercise in humility. I, I think the problem was that, so here's, here's the basic issue is that I, I had this pattern test knit before I had it tech edited. And what that means is that uh, what test knitters do, and I sometimes have to, sometimes do test knitting, sometimes don't. Um, a test knitters basically take the draft of your pattern and they, uh, they knit it up with their own yarn. Typically they're not paid, although I know that some designers do pay test knitters. Um, but they keep their, they keep the sample. And basically it's just the, the kind of trade is I'll give you a free copy of this pattern. It may have some mistakes in it, but you get it for free. And if you would just knit it within a certain reasonable time frame, and um, and give me any comments about where the pattern is confusing or where there might be some mistakes, that would be much appreciated. So I had a bunch of people helping me out with test knitting, and um, and they were really really helpful. I mean, some of them especially just gave me a ton of helpful notes. One of them was my mom. Uh, but Joanne and April especially too gave me a lot of really good notes about, you know, where things were, were wonky. And I had just messed up the numbers and, and kind of kept doing it. You know, I would, I would 
fix it <laughs> and resend it out. And in fixing it, I would, you know, mess up something else. It was just such a house of cards. And, uh, and thankfully, everybody was very patient with me. Um, what I've learned from this experience is that uh, I will, from now on, I think I'm going to have it test tech edited first. And what tech editors do is they actually go through a pattern draft and they don't knit it, but they know enough about what patterns are supposed to look like and what the numbers will and will not do that uh, they can tell you what's off and what's not. So um, I did it in the reverse order this time and I think that was a mistake. So um, yeah, lesson learned. <laughs> felt so bad because some of the test knitters actually had to rip back quite a bit and um and and you know many of them just didn't give up on it which was really quite generous of them so I really thank them for that um so now it's perfect <laughs> I'm sure it's not but it's 99.9% .9 pure just like ivory soap all right, now I'm really done. So I'm going to sign off for, with you for now, but I'm going to add on my technique video here at the end. And I'll just tell you where to get in touch with me. I'm on, uh, my website is darkmatternits.com and you can find all of the episodes there. If you watch through YouTube or anything like that, you can always find the episodes again by going to darkmatternits.com. And uh, my blog is there as well and information about my patterns and all of that kind of stuff and where I'm teaching next. Um, and uh, if you want to find me on Ravelry, I'm Elizabeth GM there, and there's a Dark Matter Knits group that is uh, really lively and wonderful. I really enjoy the discussions in that group, even if I'm not always very active in them. I definitely read all of the posts and really am interested in what people have to say. There's some very thoughtful stuff being said there. And... Um, and then on Twitter, I am Dark Matter Knits, and I'm also on Facebook as Dark Matter Knits. So I hope I will see you there sometime, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Hey, everybody. So I'm going to do the technique video on my, on my computer uh, camera today because it's a little dark in here, and I don't think my, my phone camera is going to pick up things very well. So Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, which is a, a technique that for binding off that was originally published in nitty.com by a woman named Jenny Stamen. And Jenny is spelled with one N, so it's J-E-N-Y. And uh, this is a has really kind of taken the knitting world by storm as a brilliant bind off for those times where you need something that's more stretchy. So for example, if you think about a classic place where you might use this is in toe up socks, because uh, you don't want, you know, the lat where you're binding off is around the calf and you don't want the sock to be constricting you at that place. Um, I've also found that it's really good for top down shawls. So when you're starting at the top and the bottom edge is where you're binding off, it's really nice to have a very stretchy bind off so that you're not kind of binding up the lace that it, you know, really, or whatever, you know, the edging is. It kind of allows it its full amount of, of breathing room. So uh, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, one of the complaints that a lot of people have about this bind off is, what a lot of people like about it is that it's very simple. Um, but a lot of people seem to find that when they work it, the edge is very roughly. And so I wanted to show you both just how to do this and also how to do it in such a way that you won't get this really ruffly edge. So um, I've done a two by two rib here because I want to, there's, you do this, you do the bind off slightly differently whether if you're doing purl stitches versus knit stitches. So I just go ahead and work the first stitch. So my first stitch is a purl. And now before I work the next stitch, I'm going to do a yarn over. So if you're a thrower, you just do a regular yarn over. Pull the yarn over like that. It's just right, you know, over the top. The next stitch is a purl. Whoops. 
Not sure how well this is going to work. All right, so I've got a yarn over on there. I need the yarn at the front. I purl the next stitch, and then you just grab the yarn over and the, f the first stitch that you worked. So basically the two stitches that are furthest back on the right hand needle. You grab them with the left hand needle and pull them up and over that stitch. So it's, it's basically exactly like a regular bind off. You just throw in a yarn over before you work the next stitch. So normally I would just, you know, knit another stitch and then bind off. Instead of just doing that, I'm going to put in a yarn over. The next stitch is a knit stitch. So I'm actually going to work a yarn over in reverse, which means instead of, instead of throwing it over the top this way, I'm actually going to come over from behind. So when you are, when you're, per, when you're binding off a purl stitch, when you're about to work a purl stitch, you work the yarn over from front to back. When you're about to work a knit stitch, you work the yarn over from back to front. And I need the yarn in the back to knit. So I knit the next stitch and take that yarn over, that yarn over, and that previous stitch and pull them up and over. All right, now how about that ruffly thing? When you've, when you've learned to bind off, the thing they always tell you, right? What do they always tell you? Bind off loosely. It's the name of the episode. So, you know, you're often told things like use a, a needle that is a size or two larger than what you use to work the project, which kind of works, kind of doesn't. Um, you know, don't pull the stitches too tight. Bind off loosely. The key with Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off is to work it as tightly as you can. I mean, you don't have to be... You, you don't have to strain yourself or anything, but go against all of your, all, everything you've learned about binding off. Um, you want to do this one tightly in order to keep it from ruffling. The thing about Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off is that it, um, it, it has stretch on its own. These extra yarn overs that you're putting in are what gives it a lot of stretch this way. You don't need to build any in by knitting loosely. So knit tightly here. In fact, normally I knit continental, uh, which means I hold the yarn in my left hand as I'm working, and I tend to knit more loosely when I'm knitting that way. So I'll often, when I'm working Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, I will often switch back to throwing, which is how I originally learned, so that I can knit more tightly. And here's what happens. And um, it's not, you know, perhaps maybe I need to work a little bit more here. But um, one of the lovely things about this bind off is that really no matter how tightly you work it, it is going to be super stretchy. And this yarn isn't quite as isn't quite as stretchy as uh, as some are, but if you see the the top of this, it, you can really really stretch it out a lot more. You know, as much as you can the cast on. So um, it's brilliant for anything where you need that last edge to have a lot of, and it bounces right back. You know, it doesn't it doesn't get pulled out of shape. It actually just boing bounces right back to where it was. So uh, a really great bind off, and as long as you work it tightly, it won't ruffle for you. All right, I'll see you in a couple weeks.